Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It is the 2 o'clock hour on Tuesday, folks. Ted Rawson here in our Think Tech studios downtown Honolulu, overlooking uh, Waimanalo Bay right now. Uh, in the studio with me here is Josh Levy. Josh, a long time since you've been on the show, all of two weeks, right? <laughs> yep. How are you, Josh? Good seeing you again. And uh, one of our faraway members on this, uh, on this network is uh, Charles Warner, standing by in Virginia. Charles, you there? I'm here, glad to be here, Ted. Okay, good, we got you. We have actually a facsimile of you. Your actual reality is hidden by uh, electronic media right now, but we got what looks like a uh, picture of you down here in, in, in Waimanalo, I would guess, it looks like to me, <laughs> judging by the mountains in the background. But Charles Warner is the uh, director of the uh, a, a very interesting and um, important uh, organization at the national level these days, the uh, I want to say it, I want to say it right, Charles, the Co National Council of, uh, for Public Safety, UAS. Is that pretty close? Got it, Ted. Okay, and uh, what's important about that is the whole aspect of uh, unmanned air systems that we talk about on this show where the drone leads every week really have their, their greatest uh, fulfillment in, um, in disaster management, in public safety, and in operations like that where the work they do can reduce the risk to people that are attempting to act in response and can gather information, can gather imagery, and can make analyses available to commanders uh, uh, faster and with lower risk and perhaps a lot lower cost than our conventional methods. As Josh Levy, who has been starting down that path, knows very well. But we have with us uh, Charles, because we have an event taking place on the island of Hawaii right now, the uh, lava flow in Pahoa and Leilani and uh, Kilauea. And um, it's, it's the kind of thing that drones or UAS could contribute to. Uh, the situation we have, however, is that the, our, our total use of drones in public safety has not arisen to the point where it's a common activity at this point in time. So Charles, your organization is seeking to figure out how to make that all seamless and make that successful and satisfactory. Tell us a little bit how the council got formed and where it's headed and how this current experience we have on the Big Island right now can be a learning experience heading us in a proper direction here. Sure, Ted. The National Council on Public Safety U.S. is basically comprised of 30 nation, national organizations of public safety, the chiefs of police, national sheriffs, uh, fire chiefs, internal order police, national emergency managers, and, and a host of other organizations that basically realized that there's a great value of unmanned aircraft systems, but there's a lot that we don't know. Um, and it's, it's that, that not knowing of what you don't know that prevents people from actually being able to utilize unmanned aircraft systems in the way that they could. Uh, and what we've seen now is as departments across the country in public safety are using public safety uh, UAS more often, there's a lot of success stories. And, and I'll, I'll give you one real quick one. It was similar uh, situation of, an, of a unique situation that occurred, and that was the Florida International University uh, pedestrian bridge collapse. And the Florida Highway Patrol was able to come in. They had a drone. Um, they, they waited a little bit before they actually flew, but when they actually got permission and decided to fly, they were able to do an autonomous flight, push the button, it goes up, does its flight, comes back down to create a 3D model of that particular situation. And, and so similar things like that, we start seeing that traffic forensics and similar things provide this usage that we can do things in a fraction of the time that it would take to do ground measurements with similar to or, or equal to uh, accuracy with a 3D model perspective that now lets you look at it from all different views at a time later to look at things you didn't even know that you wanted to look at. So when we think about the Hawaii situation, we have a lot of this volcanic activity that has, has really been never captured in some of these ways before. And so being able to use that technology in a lot of different ways uh, one, being able to do a 3D model of the fissures and the eruptions uh, in different time increments to see what that looks like, how is it changing, as well as using drones for the sulfur dioxide monitoring, um, as well as creating both uh, not only the 3D imaging, but your, your digital imaging, your mapping, and then combine into it your capability of uh, infrared. You have this 
whole array of things that can be done and captured for things that you don't even didn't even know that you wanted to look at later, just because you had the capabilities. And what we've seen is while we had some issues of during wildfires, we've also seen that a coordination with wildfires means that we can fly in certain areas as long as we're controlling the airspace and we coordinate who's flying where and at what levels. You can have unmanned aircraft systems flying at 100 feet and your aircraft flying at 500 or above, which is usually the case. So I think that it just opens up so many opportunities of, of knowing uh, things we don't know. And from an incident commander standpoint, or when we're making decisions on these situations, not knowing what we don't know can be the most dangerous situation that, we, that we're in. And now the affordability of being able to fly a drone, and if it gets lost, so let's just say that a projectile from the volcanic ash went up and, and took one out, it's not of such a great danger, there's no life danger, and it's not as significant value-wise because uh, some of the some of the aircraft that we use is more lesser expensive and can be disposable just for that very purpose. So that that's kind of a, a kind of a circular mindset of how this all plays. And what we're trying to do in the National Council is to start informing people in public safety, but not only public safety, but into our appointed and elected officials, so they understand the value of what this has to offer and the in the various. Uh, a la carte items that you can achieve by having unmanned aircraft systems. And that gives, gives you a summary to start with. That's a, that's a great summary. And a lot of things went through my mind, my mind as you were saying that. First of all, uh, our HPD and HFD now have COAs uh, here in Honolulu, so we have the ability to start executing. They're beginning their, their program planning and this sort of thing. How do we get them to join your council? Uh, well, the bottom line is they can reach out to the council through, the, through the emailing me. My email is charlesldwerner at gmail.com, and if they have one information, or they can go to the, the website, which is publicsafetyuas.org, and we have a host of policies and procedures from, from local, state, and federal agencies that have already done this. So they can learn from, from some of the work that's already been done, and we're working to, to continue to enhance that. Uh, we're hoping that as we go forward, we're able to create a nationwide public safety U.S. directory where we can then uh, do more collaboration between departments and share best practices, lessons learned, and, and those kind of things. Okay, so we can certainly pass that information on to them. And I think on the academic side, uh, uh, we have, I think, a lot of applications that you've seen here, Josh, at, at UH that... Uh, in terms of analysis methods and this sort of thing, and uh, maybe sensor development, and uh, that can add to this picture. In fact, you could add your reef analysis functionality to the story if should there be a marine event, event of some kind, or uh, uh, even um, even shark sightings and this sort of thing. So talk a little bit about, so Charles is aware of what you've been doing in the marine environment. Sure, yeah, so so Charles, as, as you are mentioning, you know, using uh, you know, UAV or UAS imagery to go and collect, um, whether it's ortho mosaics or, or three-dimensional point clouds to understand what's happening in your environment. You know, I was applying that just to the marine realm instead. Um, and so, you know, collecting, you know, very similar types of imagery and, and doing so in, in a way that, you know, with the same benefits that you guys were having versus using manned aircraft, you know, um, significantly less, uh, less, less dangerous, less costs, and then, you know, significantly more efficient as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, so as, as Ted knows, the uh, you know, recently graduated PhD, uh, Nick Turner down, down, at, down at Gila right now is using you know, very similar techniques to, to uh, you know, assess the, the mapping and the lava um, flowing as is going on right now in, you know, on, on, on Hawaii Island. So what we need to do is figure out how to uh, get UAS involved in exercises that don't have any downside consequence, because we're like we are right now with the volcano, there's events going on. The incident commander has his job to do. There's a lot of a lot of confusion. There's a lot of complication. There's a lot of dynamics going on daily. Daily. There's evacuations. There's uh, SO2 in the air. There's all kinds of uh, issues that make you take pause. And so, sort of stopping and adding a UAS to the system, even as good as it may be, is sort of automatically rejected by the human nature of the pe people in command who've never seen this before. So we'll take a break here in a minute, Charles, but let's think through together after we get back from this break, how we can create some kind of a national event or regional events wherein the opportunity to exercise these capabilities within the current command structure along the ESF line uh, exists. In fact, Josh is going off to JIFIX in a couple of weeks, and that's a, uh, there's a lot of oppor opportunity there for using that way of thinking as a way to uh, generate these kind of exercises. When we get back from our first break.
I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. Here we're back, folks. It's still the 2 o'clock hour on Tuesday. This is not the noon o'clock hour on Thursday where you're normally uh, expecting to see us. But uh, Ted Rolfson here in our Think Tech studios downtown Honolulu. Josh Levy joining me from Manoa, UH. And from far across the sea, we have Charles Warner, the director uh, and uh, chief of the National Council for Public Safety Unmanned Air Systems. So we're just talking before the break about the difficulty of changing the wheels and the cars rolling down the freeway at 40, and as the, the anal analogy for putting UAS into a complex uh, situation like over on the Big Island right now. So Chuck, or Charles, I keep, I keep wanting to call you Chuck because that's, it just rolls right off. Uh, but uh, what, what can you think of from the perspective of a national uh, acceptance where exercises or tabletops or something can be constructed to have the decision makers and the incident commanders see this new picture? So Ted, that's a, that's a very good point. And, and I think that to really have the effectiveness of unmanned aircraft systems to, the, to their potential, it's gonna be identifying this stuff so that people know in advance what's available and how it might be used. And so one of the things, you, you kind of hit on this a little bit, I think the regional aspect is probably the way to go. And in North Carolina, they did a tabletop exercise that they combined a tabletop with an actual, some activities that were outside flying the drone so that you could see a combination of theory and how it would be applied in that situation. And everybody had a chance to think through it and come up with ideas. So that when they now have these assets to utilize, they're already putting it in the plan ahead of time. So it's not the thinking part. It's not trying to understand something. It's not trying to learn during a disaster. Because we all know that when you're trying to learn new stuff during a disaster, we already have chaos. And trying to learn something new on top of that just creates chaos on top of chaos. So having those regional exercises are going to be the way to inform and get people to be thinking about it and then transitioning that into the plan of thinking ahead of we want to have this at what stage, who do we have to call to get these resources, do we have them local, are they regional, and, and so on. And as you mentioned, something important to know is that you, you referenced the fire and the police getting their COAs in Hawaii. Here's the important thing to understand is COAs also have some limitations. So what we always recommend is that the departments also have all their pilots qualified or certified as FAA Part 107 pilots, because then that gives them the full dimension of being able to pretty much fly in almost any situation. The COAs have some advantages, the, the Part 107 has some advantages, but if you have both, then you have the flexibility of doing the best of whichever one is applicable at the time. That's right, and we'll send you a copy of the COAs out here so you can take a look at them, see how they compare to what you see uh, across the national uh, landscape here. I do believe they're uh, tied to the 107 uh, flight limitations and uh, 107 as, a, as an expectation as your underlying base of knowledge is, is part of the, of, the, of the plan. So I think exactly as you said is uh, what, the, what they're looking at. Um, so some kind of uh, uh, exercises that could be tabletop, but I, I like your idea, tabletop inside, but, but, the, but a certain amount of the real activity taking place outside. And uh, that, that's something we've got to think about, Josh. We, we kind of do that at the stadium here. Talk about the drone boot camp and how that might translate into this, this kind of an activity. Yeah, so that, that's actually a really interesting point. So, so what, we, what we've been doing here at UH and, and trying to kind of uh, permeate throughout the, the community out here in Oahu is having these, these open boot camp um, 
you know, events where it's, it's just a day where people com can come out and start to understand a little bit more about what it means to operate UAS, um, you know, various airspace rules and regulations, and actually getting out there and flying for a little bit too. So using that that kind of half in the classroom, half outside. Um, Kind of, kind of, uh, of, of model, but the other part of the thing that we're not really talking about here is not only having the emergency responders communicating with each other, you know, the UAS guys and, and the non-UAS guys, but also having other folks that are capable of, of providing a service that are, you know, part of the community, volunteers. How do we have those public, the emergency responders? Um, trust those people to come into this into this situation and you know Let's cooperate. Let's ask Charles that very question. It's sort of a civil air patrol of drones, Charles. Is that uh, something that's under your hat in, in this in the council? Uh, well, not necessarily civil air patrol, but you know the idea was that you get people from uh, elected officials, from government agencies, from public safety, and they come together, and you kind of set out and say, you know, first you have some, you have to inform. So you kind of tell them what kind of different functions that UAS can do. So you kind of level set things so that people understand capabilities. Then you start asking, how would this apply to you and your situations? Now, in Hawaii, you're uniquely different because you might have hurricanes, you might have uh, volcanic eruptions, you might have earthquakes. So you make it pertain to those, those things that are more likely or probable to be in your area. So that's why the regional aspect makes more sense. And then say, how, how would we be able to use it? And then you take your next, your next day and you put it into applications of doing exactly some of those things to do proof of concept. So people can actually see the, the UAS fly, they can see streaming video, they can see real-time information about a situation. And then there's this whole different appreciation of, of the possibilities. And then from that, you go into transitioning to say, how do we develop our policies and procedures to implement this during an event? And, and then it's already part of the system, and it's not learning at the time you have a disaster. Okay, if, if I can go back for a minute to the point Josh just made, that uh, we have, as everybody says, a lot of people, a lot of citizens, a lot of construction companies, the power company, everybody's got drones in some form or other. They have some form of training, or maybe they don't have training. Certainly the power company is well-trained, the construction people are well-trained. So how do we put them to use in a case of disaster operations or public safety, that's the thing I was poking at. Has the, has the council taken on that task of trying to figure out how to utilize available resources that maybe haven't ever come together before? Has that crossed your, your, uh, your, into your area, Char Charles? It, it, it has been a point of discussion. The, the thing that we've been focused on right now, though, is, is getting public safety established to be able to use that. Well, and then what we're suggesting is that if you're going to use somebody else, they, they have to be trained to a certain level of ICS um, okay. so, that we, so that they know how to operate within our, our framework during that disaster. Because one of the things we've had is we've had people that have self-deployed and people that are interested in helping, but they don't understand the mechanisms by which they need to fly and that they need to coordinate with an air boss and those kind of things. So we've got to kind of I think you can do that, but you have to reach out and have a conversation with them to identify who they are, what qualifications they have, uh, that they certainly, that you have a confidence level that they know how to fly, because if you ask some of these people to fly for you, they can become an agent of the government, and then you become liable for the, act, the actions that they do. So mm -hmm. there's, there's some things you got to work on there in advance if you want to try to do that at a time during disaster. Okay, I like your idea. Let's get the elected officials and the public safety uh, a leadership and get them going first and then start bringing in these other pieces. But that doesn't mean we can't develop the other pieces in parallel well, that and goes have back, them working. And that goes back to the whole standards situation that we spoke about two weeks ago, right? And, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much preaching what, what Charles's uh, session was back at UVSI is being able to train these people on similar apparatus to understand, so we, you know, there's a grading scale and there's, there's this, this general familiarity from location to location that people have been checked out on the, on, you know, during these training systems have a certain level of, of kind of capability that people can trust in other locations as well. That kind of goes back to what Gene Robinson was telling us. So he's looking at a 90-day syllabus to get people fully up to speed with full muscle memory is in terms of how to operate not only the vehicle but also the emergency procedures and its operation within the emergency support functions. Exactly. In, in fact, uh, Charles, you know, in some of the emails we've been exchanging, the idea of the ESFs came up. I mean, that Certainly to me, and being part of the uh, communication loop on the volcano situation, 
everything runs down the ESFs. You mentioned the incident command system, and uh, uh, the, the way it's structured and organized is under the 15 or 16 ESFs that exist. So is perhaps part of the strategy to associate UAS functionality may be interpreted differently depending on which ESF you're dealing with? Is, it, is that an important um, tack to take here? Yes, and I think as you're doing a tabletop, you, you want to include the ESFs because you want to give kind of an overview of saying, here's what the capabilities are, are here's what UAS is capable of doing. Then from your ESF perspective, how would this play into what you're doing? So for example, when they were flying in Harvey, there's a couple different areas that they're looking at. One, they're looking to see what areas have been affected by the flooding. They're also able to see, are there areas where people need to be rescued? Uh, and then they're, they're looking at areas of, of the roads, what roads are open and closed. So you've got transportation, you've got fire, you've got rescue, uh, you may have EMS, you may have uh, critical infrastructure. So yes, you, the, the idea is provide the base foundation of people to understand the capabilities and then let them tell you from an ESF perspective, how would this help? Because what they found in, in Harvey, Irma, and Maria is that sometimes when they're flying, if they coordinated with ESFs, they could actually accomplish the needs for, for multiple ESFs <laughs> if they've coordinated the flight in conjunction with the needs of the ESFs. And then the, the next part from that is, what do you do with that information? How does it go to all those different you know, heads of the ESFs, and how do, we, how do they all coordinate based on that one data stream? Because you know, from what I understand, is usually they get various different streams going to each of them, and there's not that collaboration. That's a good. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. And so then it's like, how do we share the information we've collected? Is it, is it on the device itself, and we have to download it and then share it to the appropriate people? Uh, do we have to? Are we doing streaming video? Can we make that available to all the people? So yes, there is there is some coordination with what you do with what you've done. Yeah, that that's a uh, that's getting down to a very level, very interesting level of, of detail. And I would hope it would what would I, I, in my mind I'm thinking here we should construct something like that for the state of Hawaii. Now that we have a much higher level of uh, interest than we had before, we have volcano. We had the meeting with the legislature that you were at a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. We have the next legislative session coming up. Uh, there's enough motivation to start c controlling these, and th but they're going to have to be pulled together at an integrated level, because no, not, not one of these functions by itself is going to be able to carry the day, nor is it going to be able to integrate with the other functions without some forcing function. So now, Charles, uh, you've handed us a challenge. How do we put this together and copy your success here in Hawaii and uh, get it done in probably October, November, before the legislation, legislation legislative session begins, <laughs> and, uh, and at that point, it's hard to get anybody's attention. Right. So uh, we have an interesting challenge here. This is a fascinating subject, and I think you know, we could have imagined it to happen this way. The volcano forced it on us, and uh, fortunately, you're out there ahead of us, uh, you and 37 or so other uh, significant agencies that are part of the council, and I guess we need to be part of that in some formal way. So we'll, uh, we'll get on the website, figure that out, pass the word around to all of our folks here in Hawaii. And uh, Charles, uh, once again, thanks so much for taking the evening hour out of your day in Virginia and joining us here in Hawaii uh, yet again. And the next time we have to have you out here in the flesh, I would suspect, to actually maybe start off this, uh, I'm guessing, a two-day workshop we're going to now talk about. How does that sound? Yeah. I'd, I'd love to do that, and uh, and I think that your other opportunity is we've got to educate our elected and appointed officials. And one of the things, just so you know, that I've done is I've been reaching out and challenging the big seven organizations, the National Governors, the uh, National League of Cities, the uh, National Association of Counties, and all those to, to put the challenge out to them to help support advancing public safety UAS. Okay, well, we'll catch on with that. And we also have uh, the Aerospace State Association. We've got the AOPA, we've got the AMA. There's other organizations that are all headed in the same direction. We'll see what we can do to put something together out here from an integrated exercise perspective. And uh, this is a big challenge. But we'll go ahead and do it. And Charles, thanks once again for your inspiration and leadership and for coming on the show. And uh, Josh, thanks for coming over all the way from Manoa. <laughs> we'll see you all next week.